I'm really excited to have uh, John and, and Lance here to talk about um, the first step and uh, do a distribution case study. You know, John, John, I mean, I think a lot of you know, and he's been a guest before, is kind of a uh, pioneer in this field uh, um, alternate distribution um, of, of separating out um, your, mar your markets and um, taking as much control over your distribution as possible, and not just playing that game of trying to get into a big name festival and hope that a distributor you know, will find it there and take everything off your hands. So, um, and also they're gonna make my job a lot easier today because um, they have a, a you know, 30 minute or so uh, uh, presentation with slides that they're gonna give. Um, uh, and I want to make sure that I've told them I'm going to be timekeeper <laughs> that um, I'm going to leave at least a half hour for for Q and A's for you guys. Um, I know there's there'll be a lot of questions. Um, so I just want to begin uh, before we get into the presentation, just a little bit of you know ask you, John and Lance, for just you know a very brief uh, intro background because we didn't put uh, we linked to your bios in. Uh, in our mailings, but I don't, who knows how many people actually hit the link. So, um, John, why don't you begin by talking about, you know, the work you've been, you're both, you're a filmmaker and obviously an author too of Think yeah. Out's box office. So take it Yeah. Away. So I, yeah. Thanks, Doug. I'm so happy to be back on D word and, you know, it's great. I love the D word so much and, you know, um, so anyway, so I'm a filmmaker, but also um, I've been involved in distribution, frankly, since the beginning of when I started making documentaries, but really kicked into gear when I um, kind of created a path for my film Bomb It when the market collapsed back in 07, you know, the first big indie film market collapse. And I started writing some articles for Filmmaker Magazine, then wrote a book called Think Outside the Box Office then started working with filmmakers and doing presentations around the world. And that grew into my running film campaigns. And then in the last couple of years, actually, ironically, during the pandemic, I started doing theatrical releases as part of the campaigns. Um, and um, one of the first only live theatrical, you know, uh, because we were doing virtual theatrical and hybrid, and the, the first um, theatrical release that we did only in person was with the first step. And, um, you know, I think we did some really interesting things. And so I'm going to turn it over to Lance now. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Lance Kramer. Um, I'm an independent filmmaker, primarily producer based in Washington, D.C. Um, Thanks, Doug and Erica and everyone at the D-Word for having us. Really, really happy to, uh, to be here. Um, I started a, just a very quick background on me. Uh, my brother and I started a, my brother Brandon and I started a production company in DC in 2010 called Meridian Hill Pictures. Um, through the company, we produced two independent features. Our first film was City of Trees which came out 2015, 2016, and then more recently, The First Step, which is what we're talking about today. Um, we've also done a number of short commission films um, with nonprofit organizations and schools, um, and also run some youth media programs over the years. Um, and I've also just tried to be very active in the doc space, member of the DPA since not the very beginning, but pretty close to it. Um, and Eric and I have also been involved in a lot of local and regional organizing um, uh, on behalf of filmmakers in the area here in DC, Maryland, Virginia. So um, really excited to dive into things here. Yeah, being modest, Lance, you and you and Brandon are the Cone brothers of the documentary world. So um, uh, why don't you why don't we begin by just telling us how you know where did this idea for the first step come about, and how did you um, you know, how did you go about uh, filming it? Sure. Um, gosh, so the first step, um, it's, it's an independent film for one, which I just say that 
Um, you know, this wasn't something that kind of came down from above the mountaintop. It was something that was really built from our relationship that we had established with Van Jones, um, who some people know, some people if you don't, he's a uh, political commentator and activist, um, has worked on a number of different issues, but in particular has been a criminal justice reform advocate for the better part of the last 25 years. Um, he was a executive producer on our first film, City of Trees, and uh, we got to know him really well in the process of making that film. He's not in the film, but he helped behind the scenes. And then we made a short web, or we made a web series with him in 2016, independently as well, um, called The Messy Truth, which was a series where he went to the homes of Trump supporting families and tried to model how to have conversation across political divides. Um, it was a three-part series. We self-released it, it before the 2016 election cycle, which I feel like a little deja vu that, that we're almost in 2024. And in some ways, it still feels relevant. Um, but uh, nonetheless, we self-released the, the series. Um, it did quite well. It kind of blew up uh, virally. Um, online and uh, became a kind of springboard for us to further explore the kind of role that Van uh, sought to play in this new reality of the um, Trump, you know, administration um, when he stepped into office. And Van, in particular, was really concerned with what would happen to the criminal justice reform movement that he had worked so hard on over the years. Um, with uh, this new threat in the White House and found himself very committed to trying to engage with the administration at any cost to try and get something done on criminal justice reform. And we felt that that was a really rare and important story to try and tell. And that was the springboard for uh, what became the first step. A lot of other background, but I'll keep it, keep it at that. Yeah, this is a great case study because, you know, uh, most everyone here, we are, we're, we're, typically not the kind of filmmakers who, you know, Netflix comes, you know, or HBO comes down and says, hey, uh, we have this great idea, follow Van Jones around. Um, so, um, so you're really, in a sense, starting from scratch, which is where a lot of us are when we do mm -hmm. these. Um, so at what point did you bring John on? Um, in, you were brought him on as a consultant. Um, I as met a John. Producer. Yeah, I met John actually through the DPA about a year ago. Actually, I think it was last September, to be precise. Um, we at that point had been the film had been kind of out, so to speak, in the world for about fourteen or fifteen months. Um, it premiered at Tribeca in June, 2021. It was a virtual premiere. So it was at the Tribeca at Home virtual slate in June, 2021. And we'll get into this a little bit more in the um, presentation, but we had been focused on festivals for about, you know, 12, 14 months and, um, even after having done what at that point was over 40 film festivals, we did not have distribution prospects for the film and we were honestly pretty stuck. So um, I was really fortunate to meet John at a point where we were feeling really grateful for the response that the film had gotten in the festival world and certainly the way that people were responding when they saw the film, but really frustrated and burnt out by the absence of prospects for right. getting beyond the festival world. And that's that's when I was really enlightened to learn this how John operates. Yeah. This is perfect for us because, you know, we're told so often you need to prepare for your marketing and distribution outreach from the very beginning. Um, and so many, so many filmmakers come on our our face to faces and go like I'm I'm like in my festival and I don't know where to go from here. And so so John, um, before we get it, just a question for you before we go into the presentation. What, 
coming in at that point, where did you think you could help most in, in getting the film out and get attention for the film and, and, and find, and, and what kind of distribution? Did you always have theatrical in mind? No, well, actually, um, Lance is the one who mentioned theatrical. In fact, Lance wanted to do an Oscar uh, run and Oscar campaign. And I actually, I think Lance has always said that the reason he decided to work with me is because I talked him out of doing that. Um, and which I do with a lot of filmmakers is talk them out of um, trying to qualify, et cetera. And, um, you know, we had just had some experience doing some really good experience doing theatrical and Lance expressed interest and we'll get into this later, like why Lance's film was, we felt Lance's film was suited to doing a theatrical. I mean, I'll just, you know, because he had already developed strong support with organizations and he felt that, and I agreed that the theatrical would help raise the profile of the film with those organizations. So just to give a preview to that, which is coming up, but, um, and it's like, I always, you know, to me, and what we're going to present is kind of like, kind of like part of like my basics of like how to approach a film and like when thinking about distribution and marketing. And um, so I always feel like that there's a path. I kind of feel like there's a path for every film. And it's just a matter of figuring out what that path is that makes sense for you as a filmmaker, your resources, what your goals are. And um, here, I'm, or you're going to see repetition in the slides already, but I can't right, stop well, let's saying get, this. You know what? No, let's, no, no, it's okay. It's like, let's it's get like right what here. are your, where are you at? Where's your film at? Like, what are your goals? What are your resources? Like, those are, and then you work within those parameters and figure out what the path for the film is. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's, and I just think a lot of filmmakers aren't familiar with that and, you know, can be helped by, you know, you know, someone like me with experience and seeing a lot of films and working with a lot of films and, you know, and I think that's where Lance and I, you know, kind of hit it off and, you know, um, yeah. Okay, so let's, um, let's go right into the presentation then. Yeah, right. sure. Okay. So, uh, let's see, hold on a second. Sorry, I just got to pick the right screen. There we go. Okay. All right, so it's there, right? <laughs> okay. Yep. So, um, all right. So basically, you know, my one of my fundamental, you know, things that I'll say, you'll feel me saying all the time that every film is different and every filmmaker is different and every film deserves its own unique um, distribution and marketing plan and path. And that, I guess, as I just said, that every film has has a path, you just have to figure out what that path is. Um, so for me, you know, these are the essential components to figuring that out, some of which I've already said. And what if you if we work together, and Lance is probably sick of this by now, um, like, what are your goals? Like, every time a decision comes up, like, what are your goals? And, um, and we'll talk about that in a second, what stage you're at, what unique att attributes and assets does the film have? Um, looking at the different rights paths that are available, especially in terms of split rights, because in most cases, for most films these days, especially those all rights deals don't exist. And that's about all I'm going to say about all rights deals for the whole presentation is that they, for 98% of people, they don't exist. And I think even in the golden age of documentaries for 95% of films, those all rights deals didn't exist. The this myth of this golden age is just talking to someone who's pretty prominent in a film organization. It, it, that golden age was a myth for most documentary filmmakers, I believe. So, um, you know, who are your audiences and then how do you reach those audiences? Um, so, uh, add, John, can I, if I can just break in for a second. Yeah. I just want to let people know that you will be sharing the slides. Um, yeah, yeah. Here, so you don't have to spend a lot of time trying to take notes on this. Um, yeah. It will be available. Yeah, don't take notes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just uh, we'll send you, you'll get the slide deck afterwards. So, I mean, if you want to take notes, but, you know, um, go ahead. I'm not going to be dictatorial about that. But um, 
So the you know fundamental thing to me is goals. And many times when I talk to film, what are your goals? Oh, I want to be on Netflix. Oh, I want a streaming deal. Oh, I want this. I want a theatrical release. I want those are tactics. Those are not goals. That's number one. Those are all tactics to achieve an end. And the four things that I look at are money, career, change the world, and audience, getting your film seen. Those are the basic, everything boils down to that. And you basically can get one of those, especially if you're an independent filmmaker. And sometimes you'll get one and a half. And some unicorns out there, and there's like a unicorn every year or two, will get nearly all of those. But those are unicorns. And um, I find that most films are, you pick a goal and, you know, and you're in, in, then it's a matter of like, what are your expectations of those goals at the very beginning? And a lot of this is about managing expectations and just being realistic. And yes, it's good to know what your subsidiary goals are, because if like all things being equal, you're going after your main goal. Okay, well, you have a decision, has this effect, what else you want to do with the film? So those things are, you know, those things come into play. But again, it really boils down to that primary goal. So um, Lance is going to talk about his what his goals were for the first step. Sure. So just a little bit more about um, just what the film ultimately is about. I mean, I started to tee it up a little bit with Doug's question, but um, you know, the way I would it's about a lot of things, but uh, what I would maybe distill it down to is that the film follows a uh, bipartisan coalition, which included Van, but certainly wasn't limited to Van, um, of, of advocates who came together um, during the Trump years to pass this bipartisan criminal justice reform bill in what we all know is a super divided political climate, not just in DC, but obviously in the whole country. Um, and so the film is really this very personal story about the complexities of building bridges or trying to build bridges in a divisive era. Um, to help people who are impacted by injustices like the criminal justice system and um, large problems like the uh, addiction crisis. Um, and, uh, you know, initially going, building on John's uh, uh, list, you know, maybe naively or foolishly, we thought we were one of those unicorns and thought that we could do it all. Um, every every filmmaker goals, thinks they're a unicorn. So, so there you go. So which is like, you know, you give birth to your baby and your baby is the most special baby and in, in the whole world. And there's never been a baby like your baby. And your baby is going to go on to become a Nobel laureate multiple times and with multiple PhDs and, you know, and become a billionaire. And, you know, and that's what your baby is going to do because it's your baby. And, th and that's totally understandable, you know, because it's, you know, we are creative people and we, you know, if you don't feel that, then you probably haven't finished your film, to be honest. So sorry, go ahead, Lance. Um, so we had a, we had a rude awakening that uh, we were maybe just uh, normal in that sense. Um, but uh, but it was a very important uh, type of clarity because I think once we got clear on what our goals were, that's really what gave us the helped us see the path forward. Um, Prior to actually meeting John, we also did a lot of work with Annie Mercedes through the guided campaign program that she runs, um, which was extremely helpful. And the combo of being in that program and working with John really helped us get clear on these two goals for us, which were number one, to change the world, um, if you put it so bluntly, and then number two, to get your film seen um, or get our film seen. And just to break those down, a little bit more, you know, for us on the first point about changing the world, uh, for this film in particular, and for everyone who was involved with the film, um, you know, we always wanted this film to reach a very diverse audience, um, particularly across the political spectrum and also just beyond coastal cities. Um, I live in one, uh, but we wanted uh, the film to, to go well beyond DC, New York, and LA um, to jumpstart uh, meaningful conversations and hard conversations about what it takes to bridge divides and change things that feel really entrenched, like the criminal justice system. Um, and we also wanted to engage people who are on the front lines of doing this work, particularly in our case, um, system or justice impacted 
um, advocates who are really the people who are the closest to um, the issues that are represented in the film. And we really wanted to try and use the film as a blueprint for how to make change, not just at the national level, but at the state and local level um, for people who are positioned to actually do that work um, and lead, lead those efforts. And the reason for that is that we wanted our film to hopefully be a part of the ongoing work to bring people home from prison who are unjustly incarcerated and felt that the film could, could, could play a role and have an impact in that, in that respect. Um, that's why we made the film. And the second part about getting your film seen is kind of just simple in the sense that uh, we couldn't do any of that if the film wasn't seen. So um, it was really, in a sense, uh, not a means to an end, but it was an essential component of being able to fuel that first primary goal. And we were stuck, in a sense, because we had been able to have some success having the film seen um, at festivals, but we really were having trouble breaking past those um, those audiences who opt into coming to festivals. John. Yep, great, cool. So um, the next thing is kind of like, and I've combined a lot of things here for, um, you know, for the sake of the half hour presentation, but these are the major factors is where are you at in the process, which we've already talked about a bit. Um, are there any distribution deals set, which we've talked about there weren't, um, in this case, um, and then um, or we'll talk about that. Are there any distribution deals like you might have like an educational there? It, a lot of times I work with filmmakers who have some form of PBS um, broadcast coming up. Um, do you have any team members on board? What assets do you have available, which would include resources? Do you, what is essentially like what is your time commitment? What time do you have to devote to this? And then what kind of monetary resources do you have? What combination there is for that? And then what unique attributes does your film have? So those are all the things, you know, the next things that I generally talk about in relationship to a project and, um, and in relationship to the goals. So Lance will then talk about what, where he was at with the first time. We'll try to get through these pretty quickly. Yeah, I'll try to run through our stage as much as I can. So as I mentioned, you know, when Doug was first asking the questions, when we started working with John um, was about 15 months after our world premiere. Um, you know, as far as where we were at beyond that, you know, the film itself had taken five years to make. Um, that actually had spanned three administrations. Uh, over those five years. And just on a financial basis, maybe it's helpful to know that we were basically raising money up until the week of the premiere. Um, so that just gives you a sense of just kind of the um, type of environment and frenzy, if you will, that we were just consistently in through the making of and leading up until uh, this, this distribution phase. Um, we had kept a pretty low profile of the film. Um, up until the premiere, we had no website, we had no social media presence. Most of that was both because of the political sensitivities around the film and also because we were operating off of this uh, belief that it would have been possible to sell or license the film at the premiere um, at Tribeca. And so we were trying to keep a lower profile so as to not kind of, quote unquote, overexpose the film. Um, so... Uh, we were really starting. I'll just jump in. Can I just jump in? Which is yeah. why it's good to start thinking about this process before you get to the festivals. Like even if you have a sales agent, I think you should be thinking of plan B and, you know, we, you know, plan B should kind of be your plan A and got yeah. back in when we were doing the IFP lab, like, you know, 2010, we were constantly saying that. And, and so it's a matter of like figuring out what is, preparing for all that stuff way in advance and then really making an evaluation as to whether there is going to be a plan a and then if not you know how do you incorporate like your everything you're doing like your festival run and we'll talk about this a little bit later how do you incorporate your festival run into your plan b because you can do that there are ways to use your festivals for the entire i always believe when you're in festivals you're in distribution like that's part of that's part of distribution. There's no separation of festivals and distribution. Um, you're bringing the film out to the world, that's distribution. So how does that fold into everything else that you're doing? 
and you need to be super strategic about that. So yeah, we we I mean to John's point, we I'll be the first to say did not really have a plan B. So I think we were operating off of this kind of hope or belief that it would be possible at some way or form to sell or license the film. Um, it was our first time working with a sales agent for a premiere, and I thought I was kind of doing all the right things and positioning the film as well as we could for that. Lo and behold, the agent worked really hard, um, but we didn't have any deals on the table and in fact came up against a lot of challenges um, on that front, which I'm not going to go into now just because of time, but, but suffice to say it was very challenging and we walked away with no prospects at all um, coming out of that premiere. Um, so what we wound up doing, you know, is we basically had to regroup and pivot hard. Um, and regional film festivals uh, really became our first form of distribution, again, to John's point. Um, we were really fortunate to get such a strong response from regional film festivals. We were in over 40. Um, over the course of that 15 months, we tried to go to almost every single one of them in person. So even though we had had a virtual premiere, um, most of the other subsequent regional festivals were uh, in person. And between Brandon and myself and other people of the team, we tried to attend almost all of those. Um, and that was in over 30 states as well. Um, and uh, I think the, the, the important thing is to just highlight for, for, for this you know, slide um, and these ideas is just that we learn so much through going to those festivals. Um, we built a really strong network, not just of people in the film world, but also grassroots advocates all across the country who were very proximate to the film and its issues um, and doing work on a community level. We tried to invite them to as many of the screenings as possible, not just to help get the word out, but actually to appear on panels. Um, and it kind of became a de facto place to test our impact and engagement strategies because um, we basically use the film festivals to try and pilot different ideas for impact um, on the fly. And we also just understood or came to understand a lot about how different audiences um, responded to the film. Um, and just, just to quickly blaze through the assets um, that we had. So ultimately, by the time we had met John, we had really strong relationships with the protagonists in the film and all these organizers and advocates all across the country. Um, myself and Brandon and several other people from the team were still prepared to work really hard to get it out there. Um, we had developed a relationship with a part-time impact producer named Dev Devin Dansky, who was really wonderful um, and, and interested in helping to continue to spread the word. Um, we had a little bit of money that we had raised. Um, or set aside, uh, uh, the, the complexity there is that actually we had uh, funding promised or secured that ultimately got revoked before our work with John, which was quite um, uh, difficult to, to, to navigate. But nonetheless, before we started the um, theatrical, we did have some um, funds uh, that we thought were set aside. And we also had a line of credit for our company that you know we were trying really hard not to to lean on but it was there in the event that we 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 needed to lance if i can butt yeah. in with a question on that um yeah. You know, yeah on your website you have a page that, that shows almost two dozen impact partners organizations and did they so clearly you were working with them for you know well before john came on did you can you talk a little bit about how you utilize them. Did they help you raise money? They probably didn't give money directly, but did they help you in some way to? Um... Well, actually it's a really, it's, <laughs> I mean, this is kind of baked into what the film is about in a sense, but we had been throughout the process of film festivals and certainly during the process of making the film and then well beyond, have been developing all these relationships with individual advocates and also organizations all across the country. and. I'd say three quarters were progressive or bipartisan focus, but there was probably 20% or so that were conservative or right to center. Um, and that was kind of baked into the nature of the, the film. Um, the funder that we had um, 
so we didn't have any backing from any of the uh, kind of impact funders to to support any of this. Um, we uh, for the for the theatrical release had actually secured um, a grant from a um, criminal justice uh, reform foundation who was committed to supporting the release. And then actually when they found out that there was another group that was going to partner, not as a financial backer, but just as an impact and outreach partner on one of our screenings um, that they were in a policy fight over or with, um, they actually rescinded their funding. And these were actually both um, organizations that were left of center. So it wasn't even a left-right thing, it was a left-left thing. So it put us in a really difficult lurch. And, and ultimately, we wound up working with all those different partners on a non-monetary basis. So they helped to get the word out. They mobilized their audiences. They participated in panels. Um, but they weren't funding the campaign. In fact, we actually steered some of the proceeds from the theatrical campaign back to those organizations. So, um, but just to, I'll, I'll just quickly finish up uh, just some notes here, but um, you know, we just we also had some um, marketing assets. We had already created a trailer ourselves and created a press kit through the festival release. So that was something that or the festival run. So that was something that we brought to the table. Um, we had used the film festival, um, the regional film festivals to also build up some. Um, regional press. Um, we had held back on most national pitches throughout that whole time because um, we had gotten advice during the Tribeca release that we didn't want to kind of be overexposed again to use that word. So we hadn't done big national pitches at that time. Um, and I just say that um, our decision to not pursue awards, particularly Academy Awards, was an asset. Um, because that really freed us up to not get um, distracted and kind of diluted into thinking that that was something we needed to focus on. So once we made that decision, I actually kind of consider that a real asset of ours because it, it it freed us up to focus on what was most important, with especially with the limited resources and time that we had. Okay, I'm going to move on. So um, for me, um, the next thing to think about is like what rights and how you're going to um, deal with the different rights that are available to you. And I kind of put these rights into buckets, which I did. I actually conceptualized this uh, when I wrote the book, um, Think Outside the Box Office, and it still feels like it sticks pretty well. Um, and this is for documentary filmmakers because educational obviously is so important. Um, and so one bucket is events, which includes festivals, theatrical, community screenings, any kind of screenings that you do. And the reason that I put those all into one bucket so that filmmakers don't think of those separately and think of the, and to think of how those are going to work together with each other. Um, and this gets into, and we'll talk about windowing in a second, but in, in what you want to, after you consider these rights, Part of what you want to think about is how you're going to window these rights, how you're going to release them in sequence, in a sense. Um, so the next category is digital and broadcast, um, which now is very apparent that those are kind of blended, those kind of compete in the same space. Um, but 10 years ago, they were considered pretty separate. The, the notion of broadcast competing with SVOD was, you know, which is a subscription video on demand, which is Netflix, et cetera, uh, wasn't really apparent yet. Um, but that's, so these rights are transactional video on demand, which is TVOD, um, SVOD, subscription video on demand, and then broadcast would be similar to that. Um, and then AVOD, which is ad supported video on demand. And usually there's a sequence of these going, depending on if you have an all rights deal from an SVOD platform or a broadcaster, they usually want to be first. Um, and that's still true for any kind of PBS broadcast. And then you have to figure out where your TVOD and AVOD is floating in relationship to that. And um, there are considerations of thinking about how well you feel your film's gonna do on TVOD, transactional video on demand. It's pretty 
challenging these days for most films because people have so much content. Um, they have all their, you know, SVOD channels that they subscribe to, plus they're watching TikTok and Instagram and a zillion music, et cetera. We're basically in this age of abundance. So how are you going to get someone to pay four bucks to rent your movie when they have all this other stuff, all this other content that is essentially quote unquote free to them or they view as free to them, even though they might be paying for it in different ways. Um, then educational, which is basically a combination of events and digital. And you have to be aware of when you get into windowing, um, you have to be thinking about how educational can be released in different ways in relationship to, you know, whether you're just going to do um, public performance rights and allow that for a certain period of time, but then window off, talk to your educational distributor about holding back kind of broader educational sales, such as like Canopy, um, that kind of, in a sense, can compete with what you're doing in the event space. Um, and then both of these, all of these rights, you want to think about domestic and internationally, you know, how you're handling them domestically, which might be if you're European, your domestic is obviously your domestic, but you might then be thinking about how you handle North America, um, and then how you handle the rest of, of the world outside of North America. So um, the next thing I want to talk about um, is what, because theatrical was such a big component to the first step, is what kind of considerations and things that you should be thinking about in terms of doing a theatrical release. So the, primarily the big thing is whenever considering the, any kind of thing that you're doing is how does it work with your goals and does it make sense? Um, another aspect that's important, the, one of the main reasons to do theatrical is if it's gonna trigger press. Um, one of the early um, virtual theatrical releases we did was for um, Two Gods um, um, by the Ali brothers. And um, they already knew from their festival release that there was going to be some press around it. And just by doing the virtual release, this is in the golden days of virtual releases during the pandemic, you know, basically for very little cost, you could do a virtual theatrical release and it triggered critics pick in the New York Times and a slew of other press. And that was a huge benefit to the film in a variety of, you know, how it was helping them meet their goals. So, um, you know, if your film, theatrical is a big, big lift. I'm just not gonna, it's a lift in terms of getting audience there. It's just a lot of work and it costs money. So you really wanna make sure that it makes, it fits for you. Um, and for the first step, I, I, I felt that the film was pressworthy for a variety of reasons, um, not the least of which is an excellent film. So we thought it would be well-reviewed and well-covered. Um, and then the other consideration for theatrical, the way we approach theatrical, and this is actually Lance coined because we were kind of developing this as we were going and probably other people have done this as well, but the way we did it and the way we continue to do it feels unique is because we, we basically use organizations to drive butts and seats to the theaters. Um, and we usually do a New York week run and an LA week run. And then every other city is where there's organizations that's gonna support a theatrical release. Yes, sometimes we, we do blast out to theaters and there are theaters who say, we're gonna show this, we have an audience for this, great. But most theaters wanna know that you're gonna get 30 to 50 people there. and so um, you want to be able to be know that you're going to have that audience. And one of the attributes that Lance um, came with was they, they had already done all this groundwork with organizations and that they knew cities where their, where their organizations were strong, that they could guarantee um, a certain number of people coming to the theater. So that's important. And then we don't, you don't necessarily have to have that when you start like thinking about this, but you have to, you know, a month before, two months before you're getting into theaters, you have to know that you're going to be in a position where that's going to happen. Um, um, can I ask um, if you, you work with a filmmaker who, who, want, you know, who wants to go out theatrically, in terms of resources, what do you think is the minimum amount of money it would take to launch a theatrical if you don't have the string of organizations, you know, and big organizations to help you 
get people in seats? I would say it's like somewhere around 75 to 100, because part of that's going to be bringing on an impact producer to do that work, you know, um, because you have to have that work the way that we approach films. Um, and that's, you know, you can do theatrical if there's a certain kind of film that will hit art house audiences in a specific way. Um, you know, usually ones that have some kind of buzz, maybe there's a prominent director or a celebrity involved, or it's like a known musical thing, or it's some sort of, you know, there's certain kinds of films that do well and certain kinds of docs that do well in art houses just on their own. But even then you need some support, organizational support. Rarely will it just perform well on its own. Um, but um, you need to have money to do. And that's if you haven't done any of this work, you have to really start six to nine months before your release to start building. You need that lead time to build that audience. Um, so, and then that would, I would say, <clears throat> when we get down to resources, you know, theatrical, you know, go, if your goal is money, theatrical is not, you know, probably in your toolbox. You know, it might be depending on the circumstance. I'm, I never, I try never to have absolute statements because there's always exceptions. Um, but generally, you know, theatrical has been a lost leader even for studios for a long time. Um, and it's certainly a lost leader for most independent films. I'll, I'll just interject. Um, Heather Spohr had a comment about, you know, you, you can do it without that chunk of money, which is inaccessible to 99% of the filmmakers here. Um, she's a perfect example. We have um, one of our, uh, in our D word YouTube channel, we did a focus face to face, including Heather on do it yourself distribution success stories. So I highly recommend uh, people check that out. Um, yeah, no, I mean, um, especially if you're doing it. Yeah, there's, there's, you know, if you have depending a lot of work, on how, yeah. what? Sorry, what? A lot of work. It's a lot yes, of work. It's a, it's a lot of work. So you're, you know, if you're doing a lot of that yourself, then you don't need to bring people on. If you're, if you're your own impact producer and you're doing, you know, DIY publicity, you know, all those, when I said that, you know, that kind of covers everything from creating key art, to creating trailer, to hiring impact producer, hiring a publicist, hiring a booker, hiring, you know, hiring all the different elements for a release. Um, so yeah, and there are, you know, people, scrappy people who have done it for less. Yes, yeah. I would say. Um, uh, just a heads up that we got uh, 10 minutes yeah. more. Before. Okay, all right. So, um, all right. So windowing, I think, um, you know, just, I think let's just kind of like go through these. So you want to window, um, you know, and the thing, the one thing I would say about windowing is that you kind of want to think about blending these in a sense, like you don't have to have just your festivals, then just community or just theatrical, et cetera. You can, you know, you, you can work, start with your festivals, especially some places want world premieres or premieres, then you can start to blend in community, even educational, um, and then even theatrical can start. And that's a whole discussion about how you you're doing theatrical, you wanna make sure that you're not blowing your audience in those cities, but if you're smart about it, you can kind of blend. But you know, at a certain point, theatrical takes some precedence and then after theatrical, then you can have a mix of community and educational. Um, but then you wanna think about how you're windowing in educational and then how you're windowing in your, your VOD release. And so Lance, do you wanna talk a little bit about this or should we just skip to educational i'll just briefly say that you know for us with doing the theatrical really the um maybe the biggest uh um aha moment was that we could make our theatrical and impact campaign in a sense the same thing we called it a theatrical release because that felt important particularly for press and awareness that was something that people understood um, and could engage with and cover. Um, but really what it was, was that we used the theatrical and theaters in particular to run our impact campaign. And in a sense, actually running our impact campaign through a theatrical release wound up being more cost-effective. Um, and I think in the end more impactful than had we done it as something else. Um, a lot of the partners that we've developed relationships with did not have access to space 
And so for them, actually, the benefit of being able to have these events in theaters was really significant to them. Um, also, for their own visibility, um, the ability to um, partner with a film that had some degree of national awareness um, and created a platform for them wound up being really important. Um, and then to have that kind of space held in a theater as opposed to other spaces where maybe they were familiar with um, organizing other events was really significant. Um, and then also, you know, we did have to front costs to work with the booker and certainly we um, paid, you know, John's fees, um, but we didn't pay um, rental fees. So every single theater that we were able to get the film into, which I think was over 30, were all through bookings. Um, and that was really, really um, a, a surprising thing to me that we could have um, that kind of response from theaters. And really what was essential there was all those partnerships that we had built where the theaters saw that we had those relationships and that the organizations would help get people out. And that was critical to getting the bookings. Yeah, um, I may be leaping ahead of your slideshow, but we only have about five minutes left in it. Um, how did, did, was it the theatrical that helped lead to the digital distribution? Um, you wound up, you're streaming on Apple TV, Google Play, Vudu, you're renting on Prime Video and YouTube movies. Would that have happened, uh, John, do you think without the theatrical? Yeah, I think you can always put your films up onto those platforms. That's not the hard part. The hard part is figuring out how to get people aware of that. Okay. Um, well, first, yeah. how did how did you get it up? Did you use an aggregator? Yeah. So we, um, I think Lance already knew it. It was through Desktop, which is actually kind of a digit more of a digital distributor than an aggregator. And so, and I think they came on during the theatrical, and I think they, you know, were try, you know, because we had already gotten a fair amount of press already. Um, and I think the timing of it was um, to take advantage of the kind of like two month theatrical window to then launch TVOD so that the <clears throat> publicity and the awareness around the theatrical would then bleed into the transactional release, which is pretty kind of a standard, you know, um, which is not uncommon to do that, um, you know, have some sort of one month, two month window. Um, you know, for theatrical to then go into, but, you know, it's, that's a huge conversation in terms of when you're planning whatever kind of event release is where um, VOD is going to happen. Um, and I would just, you know, you, and that involves a lot of considerations and, you know, there's a fair amount of discussions around that. So it's not, there's no cookie cutter, um, you know, uh, solution for that. And so, yeah. And I think that there's the other thing, I think there's still some SVOD and broadcast discussions on the table, which, you know, I'd say, and I think, you know, have been helped by the press. You know, there's a pretty big avalanche of press from the release. And, um, you know, hats off to our publicist, um, Emma Griffiths, but also Lance and Brandon had developed a lot of press relationships on their own. And I think that's really helped the, the, theatrical if you have that can really trigger that it's much harder to do press without a theatrical release still in this day and age it's possible but it's much it's much more difficult to get press for a vod release um again we have five minutes before the q &A, okay. so, just so i think we can just so so i'll just you know we did educational through good docs um i think lance you know one of the things that lance do we could have that could have started earlier you know and if those conversations had started earlier, like some of that could have been blended a little bit with the theatrical um, and then allowing there to be a longer educational window before it went on to VOD. Um, and then, um, you know, we already talked, frankly, we already talked about this, so maybe I'll just move on. So I'm just gonna, Lance, is it okay if I just blaze through the last slides? So we've already kind of talked about digital broadcast. So I was gonna talk a little bit about marketing and audience, but I think everyone, there's been lots of webinars, so I'm just gonna go very briefly and then you can access this through the slideshow. We'll keep this going. Um, basically, you know, going back to this, 
my feeling distribution's relatively easy, except for theatrical. Theatrical's tough. But the reason theatrical's tough is because mark getting audiences to want to see your film, that's marketing is the tough part of this, of all of this. Um, and so kind of figuring out how you're going to market your film is like a key component. And it's for me super important to go after niche audiences. And so the niche audiences for the first step were basically people interested in criminal justice reform and people interested in bridge building. Those were the key niche audiences that we went after. And then within each niche, you want to go after a core audience. So in this case for criminal justice reform, it was organizations who are organized around criminal justice reform, which then pushes out to people in, that are interested in criminal justice reform. And this is super simplified. There's a lot of other elements to this that are in play, but just to keep it very, as far as you know, illustrating how this works, that's I think fine. And then, so to reach your audience, there's this, you know, one model is this piezo model, which is paid, earned, shared, um, owned media. Um, a little trouble with the piezo model is that it puts paid first, which is not the case with most independents. Paid's a component, but especially like, for instance, in most filmmaker, and you can look at this slide will be in the deck, so you can look at this um, later. But for the first step, the, and for most films, it's this shared mode, which is organizations and social media um, are key ways of reaching your audience. Then the owned resources that you have, which is your own email list, which I'm a big advocate for. Like if you hear me talk, I'll talk about that ad infinitum, your website, and then the content that you create. Um, earned media is your press, which was a big factor for the first step as well. And then paid was somewhat of a factor. Um, and paid's a bigger factor for big brands and for studios. It's with, if you don't have a lot of money to throw into paid ads, you're looking at those other three elements. And the reason I like this model is because it helps you organize your thinking around how you're going to approach audiences. Um, and then, you know, but in this, this discussion could go on hours and hours, but I'm just trying to like wrap this up. So I'm going to not hog it completely. I'll get, let Lance talk about the results and then we're nearly done. Um, okay, so we'll just wrap up um, at least this first part of the, the talk. Um, through the course of the roughly six weeks that we did a theatrical, um, we did about 50, I think it was 49 or 50 events, um, individual screenings throughout that time period. Collectively, it engaged over 100 organizations, partners. Um, it was in over 30 cities. Um, we sold out the New York, DC, and LA openings that were a part of uh, that release. Um, the coalition within those 100 organizations was really diverse and quite broad. We had some events, particularly I'm thinking of in Arizona, where the film's release was co-sponsored or co-partnered um, by, uh, by uh, the ACLU and a organization that was backed by the Koch brothers that focuses on criminal justice reform. So you had very solidly left of center progressive groups, in some cases partnering with solidly right of center groups to co-present the film and have these really hard, um, but I felt quite important dialogues um, around the issues in the film. Um, those dialogues also wound up collectively um, advocating for over a dozen bipartisan criminal justice reform bills in states across the country. Um, we tried to use those screenings as activations for those bills in particular. Um, you know, John mentioned we were able to secure a bunch of national press for the film. We had a, um, coverage in the New York Times and Politico, LA, LA Times, the Guardian, a bunch of other um, regional publications. Um, some of that, very much to Emma Griffith's great credit, came through her hard work. Some of it came through contacts that we had built along the way. And we just tried everything we possibly could, um, you know, collectively to, to secure press. Um, and then just on the long tail, um, you know, as we talked about before, it did help certainly to do the theatrical um, 
in getting the relationship with desktop secured. Um, as, as John mentioned, I think we could have, um, there's, you know, Film Hub and others that you can work with um, without going through all this, um, this effort to do it theatrical, but the desktop relationship was assisted by the theatrical because they saw how doing the theatrical could help them with making um, additional SVOD and AVOD and broadcast pitches and also could help the eventual performance of a TVOD release. John, so, or, um, try. Lance and John, if, if you don't do a theatrical and you're just trying to get out to a digital release, yeah. what does an aggregator generally charge? For their help. Well, I could tell you, market. like, just on, I mean, and John knows about this more, but um, we actually just put City of Trees up on Film Hub and it didn't cost us anything. They didn't charge any film fees up front. Well, so, at least in that experience. Yeah, so I, but, so I think that, let me just break it down so that still, it takes a, usually they'll take a percentage and then it's a matter of expenses. So um, those are the two main cost factors, just to simplify everything. So yeah. and the percentages range from 20% um, to now 50%. A lot of digital distributors are taking 50%, even for TVOD, whereas that would have, five years ago, you would never hear of any digital distributor taking 50%. And I think part of it is because the business has become so hard. Um, and then, so they take 20% usually after um expenses and so like for film hub doesn't take expenses they just do straight 20 percent. but others will take some sort of expenses for encoding fees maybe they do a little marketing usually i would advise capping those expenses when you're doing your deal um, and you can usually argue to cap those expenses because it really doesn't cost distributors that much to encode your film it costs so it's max it should be 2000 2500 to for encoding costs um, so that's the very short answer to that. So right. I did pop up the slide to shamelessly yeah. promote. I uh, encouraged you to do it. So, yes. so um, I'm starting a distribution intensive. Um, one of the things I left out of my bio, I helped start the IP Filmmaker Lab. Um, and then I ran it for 10 years. And then, I, as you know, I've done a lot of teaching. And I really feel like, especially since the landscape's so broken and so many filmmakers need help, that um, I still do one-on-one -on -one consultations and still run campaigns for filmmakers, but to to a, a lot of filmmakers have mentioned um, that they felt that you know doing a group session where people can also learn from each other. And so each week for six months, I'll be doing a presentation or reviewing people's materials and then doing a group discussion, you know, with a cohort of eight to ten people. Um, and then some of the people will be approaching distribution, but I think some of the people will actually be in, you know, some of the people will actively be in distribution. Um, and we'll be covering everything that we just talked about, plus more. Like when I listed out all the topics to do as presentations, there's actually more than, you know, I'll be combining certain topics on certain weeks because there's so much obviously to cover as I've been going so quickly. So it's going to cover all aspects of marketing and all aspects of distribution, but related to, you know, there's going to be principles laid out, but then it's going to be a discussion around how that relates to your film. So um, I'm going to be doing, you can, I, on my website, and maybe I'll just even, you know, flick over to this in my, there's, this is all in the, on my website, and then on the website, you can go down and I'm going to be doing um, informational uh, webinar coming up in the next couple of weeks. And then, but sign up for it, I'll let you know. And then you can also then just apply for it. So, um, so, yeah. Um, by the way, yeah, you might want to look in the chat. There seems to be a typo in the link for your intensive, John. Um, oh, we are going to go. We'll just, I will drop the link in the chat then to make okay. sure. So, um thanks we're i have plenty of questions myself folks i only see one I, i'll take it off share now right yes please, don't need, please do. yes right. and um now we're going to give it over to questions from you guys i only see one hand raised so i have plenty of questions i'm not shy about asking but uh, uh this is your opportunity oh good okay here we go uh irena you're up first all right hello can you hear me Yes. Yeah. 
Okay, excellent. Thank you so much for a great presentation. Really appreciate all of the information. So my first question would have to be about publicist. Um, um, that was a very important um, element that you uh, coined earned, uh, what was it, earned? Earned media. Earned media, right. So um, my question would be, kind of case specific. So I have a premiere coming up in LA in one week and um, um, uh, looking for a publicist. I know that from my previous um, experience, publicists are very expensive that could take up to five, $6,000 a day. So- oh, Not a day. Usually you can usually get a publicist to do the entire campaign I don't want to speak, you know, somewhere in the eight to 12 range, you yeah. know, and that's for the, and that usually you should fold the VOD release. So long as the VOD release is close to the theatrical um, that you can get that, I would negotiate a package, you know, that includes all that. So, um, but it's going to be, I just hate to say, it's going to be hard to do publicity, get a publicist a week before the release to want to come on. It's, I mean, there might be someone out there, but you know, that's just going to be a little tough and you're going to be paying them still like at least five grand probably. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Um, any alternatives for like a really super low budget, just so that I use the opportunity somehow. I mean, I, you can do like, we've actually like on some of our releases now, we're actually doing our own DIY, our own in-house like publicity for smaller markets, you know, where sometimes the publicists, and so you just research like who's covering, you have to just get on it like ASAP and just research what press there is and um, and then try to really re look hard um, for, um, you know, for people's email addresses and, was it um and i'm just forgetting there is a lisa can text me lisa's my assistant and she can text me there's an app that we use for getting people's email addresses which costs a certain amount per month but if you're doing it for one month you know you though you can usually get for a certain fee they'll get you can scrape they scrape out people's email addresses and you pay for that service to access that actually lisa why don't you just drop that in the chat i think it's it's not right it might be rocket reach but yes, yeah, yes, rocket, 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 reach. rocket reach. So, um, so I yeah. would just get on that really fast. Just start looking at the publications you want to reach and then see who covers, you know, who the publicists, who the journalists are, and then just start emailing them. I'll um, just add when you're in festivals, I highly recommend you work with the press office of a festival who can be very helpful in connecting you with local media as well. Uh, Nancy, you look very dreamlike. Um, I'm trying to figure out this lighting here. Okay. Um, hi, um, guys. It was super helpful um, presentation. John, we actually met last year. Um, my film was in Doc NYC. And Love I Doc NYC, and I approached yes. yep, yep. you after your panel. Um, we actually were in email touch for a little while. And then, yeah. you know how these things are <laughs> just kind of ended. So I... I think I sent you a link to my film okay. and I'm just hoping that we can reconnect. Okay, sure. Yeah. Just happens. shoot me an email if you have my email. I'll send so you another email. Me, yeah, yeah shoot I'll me another do that. email. Great. Sure. Thank you so much. Sure. Okay, thanks. Uh, AK. Hey, hey, thank you uh, again. Super helpful. Um, I guess I'm trying to phrase my question that's twofold. I'm in early production uh, of a personal doc and uh, obviously trying to build that impact, uh, you know, partnership uh, with partners and brands early on, trying to figure out the best approach to developing the relationship, making the ask for money and support or, you know, et cetera. Um, so part of me is wanting to know like, how to like how much time to build a relationship how to then raise in you know uh you know your audience versus money financial support versus uh you know ideological support but then it was interesting when you were talking about exposure i mean i was gonna still apply to all the pitch panels and stuff not because i want to get these grants or pitches but like sometimes just them knowing like or getting into a pitch like doesn't that bring up conversations with early yeah. buyers with for pre sale yeah. yeah and it's also it's just it makes the world aware of you it makes festivals aware of you it makes the whole landscape aware of you 
So, and then you start getting tracked. If you get on one of the, you know, one of the 20 prominent pitch fests that are right. out there, you know, then you start getting tracked. All that tracking helps for festivals <clears throat> and then theoretically for sales. <clears throat> but, um, you know, sales are so tough. Like, you know, I, I, and I think it's just good practice for learning how to speak about your film. But like right. there was, I was at a pitch, a very prominent pitch um, this spring. I won't say which one in the, in it, there was no one offering any money. You know, there's just like, there's mm -hmm. not, no one was offering, you know, so it's not, I wouldn't, it's, it's tough going into those pitches now and expecting, you know, cash. Um, but going to your, I think more beneficial yeah. is starting to work with the organizations early on. Um, and, um, and then even doing a brain trust with those organizations early on and mm. making them feel part of the process. I mean, I think Lance started very early in this. Uh, we have another film that we worked with called No Small Matter, which is about early childhood education. And they mm. were, you know, they got funded from the organizations. They started a brain trust very, even before production and really kind of find out like what would be angles that would help the, <clears throat> their organizations it's and this is where it gets a little tricky because as documentary filmmakers, you don't want to change your film or tailor your film. Right, for, right. But it, then it also then goes back to what your goals are. If your goals are about change and there's a certain world, you potentially want to work with that world mm -hmm. to see what's going to be most effective for change. And that was definitely the case with, for instance, No Small Matter. And I think it was the case with Lance. So it's these are all calculations, but I, I do encourage starting early. Um, it does yeah, take I mean, a while I, to develop these relationships. Certainly. Yeah, I, I guess I, there I, could I, be I, smaller films you could maybe make for the organizations that could synergize, perhaps, if, if yeah. there's money and support. Sorry, I'll just keep talking. On, on that point, though, um, uh, Lance put an interesting uh, thing in the, mess, in, the, uh, in the chat, which I was going to actually ask about you know, what you might do differently. Um, so I just want to point people to that because He's basically talking about wishing they'd started promoting earlier, you know, and doing, um, you know, worrying about holding off on press exposure for down the line. Um, so important point. Um, Gary. You're muted, Gary. There we are. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Yes, thank you, gentlemen. This was uh, really great. Um, my um, question is really that um, I help some first time filmmakers. I'm an editor by trade. Uh, I, I actually ended up getting a producer credit on the documentary that we did. It's called Amen, Amen, Amen. Story for our times. It's amenthefilm.com. Um, we did really well on the festival circuit internationally, won over 25 laurels. Uh, and all that, and thought we were on our way to distribution. I, again, I'm not, I'm, you know, the editor. So it's been frustrating to me that we've gotten all this recognition on the festival circuit, but yet that has not translated into a distribution. So is it too late? I mean, we it was done. Uh, we finished it in, at the end of the pandemic, 2021, 22. It aired on uh, PBS, WNET in New York. Um, but that was basically it. And since then, we've been doing, you know, private screenings and that kind of thing, but uh, nothing has really gained any traction. I mean, it seems like you've, you know, you got on WNET and it's just, yeah, 2021, it is 2020. I would, if I would just because, you know, people are concerned about the timeliness of films. And so whatever you're going to do next, I would work on now. But um, I think there probably are avenues like, you know, I don't know your film. So, you know, um, but there are things that you can still you can still do. I would just say the larger point is to not for no one to these days, especially expect that a festival run is going to result in a sale. Like what one film sold out of Sundance, maybe another couple since then, you know, which is the premier sales festival for docs in the United States. And um, it's just not that time period. So don't have that expectation, have the expectation that you're going to have to figure this out. You know, you're going to have to be responsible for this, you know. Um, for the sake of those who are going to be watching this on uh, the recording later and don't have access to the chat, 
Um, Lance, you've been dropping in some nuggets in the chat about what you wish you had done differently. Um, so um, why don't you go into some of those now um, and, and maybe pipe in John yourself if um, you have any thoughts. Uh, sure. Yeah. Someone had asked about like things that we would have done differently. I mean, I could spend 90 minutes just talking about that. So I'll try to, conde try to condense it, but you know, some things that I had been putting in the chat, um, just listing them, uh, you know, I wish that we had released on educational way, way, way earlier. In fact, I would have been thrilled to just come out at the premiere and say, you know, we're going to be at festivals. And in the meantime, you can get the film on educational. I think we would have had a great window to push sales that um, we missed because we were holding out for that elusive sale that never happened. Um, so that's a huge one for me. Um, I wish that we had been um, fundraising for the what ultimately became this impact theatrical release, but effectively the film's release. I wish that we had known what that would entail time and money wise at the beginning and had been fundraising and budget, budgeting for that early on rather than well into um, the time frame after the film had been out in the festival world. I think we would have been, who knows what we would have been, but I think we would have a better shot at securing resources for do you think um that some of the impact partners that you had would have been more inclined to fund the outreach portion rather than production portion of the film if you directed the ask in that way well our impact the partners were all mostly grassroots organizations so i don't think that they were necessarily in a position to put resources in themselves but i think the fact that we had those relationships would have been significant to funders to see that we had built that network and that if they invested in the release, there was actually the relationships and the kind of right. capacity there to actually do something that we weren't just, you know, making that up. Um, and then maybe just lastly, I would say, you know, a simple thing, but we really were not very aggressive in collecting email addresses during festivals. Sounds so simple, but I was like banging my head against the wall that we didn't do more clipboards or whatever, QR codes, whatever, because flip by the time we got around don't to Don't rely doing... on, okay, even if you use a QR code, use clipboards. clipboards yeah. You know, people, like, people explain do clipboards. clipboards, what you mean Just, by you Like mean literally three, a clipboard with like a legal pad. A pad of pay. Pass it around the will audience. Give you, people will give you an email address on a clipboard way before they're going to enter it into any kind of electronic device. It's some yeah. sort of disconnect from yeah. some sort of mental disconnect. Flip, three yeah. clipboards pass around during your every single screening. Yeah. And Not one just last one, thing, multiple clipboards. Sorry. Just yeah. To, and one other thing I want to mention, this is just like a small tip, but for anyone, I know that not all films and look, big caveat, and I've seen it in the chat too. Not all films have this kind of um, goal or, you know, dynamic of these types of, you know, organizational partners. So I'm very um, aware of that. But given the fact that a lot of docs do touch on different social issues, um, if you're thinking about not even theatrically, but any sort of self promotion or marketing on social media that would involve paid um, ads on social, make sure you try to get politically verified. This was something I did not know until very, very like far into our process and we kept on we were trying to do some boosted ads and paid ads on social and it kept on getting rejected because facebook's algorithm was falsely thinking that we were a political campaign which we weren't but everything got rejected so we lost a lot of time on the paid ads had to go through this really onerous process of getting politically verified through facebook through meta once we did that though then we could do paid ads and it was a eureka realization to me that the even with a small amount of money that we put into paid ads the results were way 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 higher than organic so i wish that i had known that earlier and had gone through that process so we could have actually taken 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 advantage of what and you, you can do even with a small paid budget so just to just to chime in like you can do um you can smartly start using Facebook business manager early on, so long as you're willing to commit to social, which means willing to commit to regular posts, which I don't recommend starting social until you're ready to do that. You can start doing very 
tiny budgeted like $100 a month or even $50 a month of growth ads. And then you can even do ads so that you can set up an email signup list in Facebook and then do a campaign within Facebook ads to get people to sign up for your email list. And then you download those emails and then import them into MailChimp. And especially if you've developed an audience already on Facebook or a project that you've done, you can then use that audience and drive them to sign up for an email list and then pull those into your email list. But I, anyway, that's, what was your first main question about this, Doug? Because I wonder uh, if there's something was, I was going to uh, say about uh, that. What you might do differently. Actually, John, what right. you might you have done differently? Um, I would have talked to Lance sooner. So <laughs> I would have liked to have talked to Lance like when he started. That's in retrospect of what we did. I think we did on this one, I think we did a pretty good job. Like the only thing was like a little bit of time aspect and that would have helped, you know, as educational, et cetera. So if we had just had started six to months to a year earlier, at least advising, not even starting the campaign, but at least advising early on, I think it would have helped the, a lot of things. And Lance has already touched on that already. Okay, back to our questions, Jim. So you mentioned needing six to nine months to build for a, threat, build for a theatrical release. What should we be doing during that time? Well, that's, and that's not even just for in the theatrical release, but even if you're doing a community engagement campaign, community screenings, you're essentially researching your audience, um, researching what organizations are within that audience, researching the relationship of those, how those audiences sit with each other. Like as Lance mentioned, he, you know, there are two organizations that were in a policy fight with each other. Unfortunately, on the left, which is a lot of where all these organizations reside, there's as everyone knows about the problems with the left is that we fight with each other or then so you have to figure out all those politics and then figure out the relationship of national organizations and local organizations and how so all this kind of like quote unquote impact work this to me takes that's what takes time it usually takes several months to start creating these relationships and also to get a sense of where these organizations, these organizations are thinking a year in advance, six months in advance. So if you're just coming to them, I have a film and you know we're releasing in two months, most of them are just gonna roll their eyes and you know not engage with you. If you are a unique film and they're a unique audience and they've never had a film speak to them, you have a better shot. But if you're working within a space where there have been other films made, you know, you're going to have you, the more lead time you have, you know, a long answer to a short question is you're doing all this audience development work with organizations, and then also directly to your audience, um, you know, in that time period. Um, Lance and John, are you willing to go a few minutes over? Oh, or I was going to say earlier, I'll go as long as you want. Like, I love <laughs> doing this. This is like, uh -oh. I, it just makes okay. my day. Yeah. So if you guys want to stay another half hour to an hour, like uh, I I can't, but uh, <laughs> maybe but that's that's well, let's see. Uh, thank you, though, Peter. Hey, guys, um, you know, I, I think for a lot of us who are making more personal films and, you know, looking for social impact as well as, you know, sustainability, um, your your stories and your films and your wide long tail distribution I mean, is it, beautiful stuff. I'm curious, bottom line, were you guys able to make money on these? Were you able to break even, make money, pay yourselves? Maybe too personal a question, but just trying to under manage expectations for all of us, because you guys look like you hit the ball out of the park on both of them. Lance, do you want to? No, that's a good question. Um, and actually, I'm planning on, um, I know we have limited time now, but I'm planning on actually writing something that breaks into the financials in more detail. I did the same thing. Um, I'll drop into the chat. I kind of opened up our books on our first film, City of Trees, and did an article um, in Documentary Magazine a few years ago that just literally broke down all the income and expenses. Um, so you could find the budget and everything. I'll, I'll drop that in the chat so you can um, see, we were in debt on City of Trees, um, um, and part of what motivated me to figure out a different way on the first step was figure out, could you make a film without being 
in debt at the end. Um, the accomplishment for us was that by the time we hit Tribeca, we were not in debt. And I was kind of quite proud of ourselves for figuring out how to make the film and break even pre-release. And then we actually wound up going into debt only on the other side of the premiere and release where we were not able to secure distribution and had to figure out some way of still releasing the film into the world. So that's actually where we um, wound up encountering the debt, which frankly, we still are sitting on. Yeah. When, it look, when I, we looked at all the list of all the cities that you're going to, you know, creating events for and going and talking in person, I mean, I imagine just travel costs and, you know, uh, wherever you're staying must add up. Yeah, um, a lot of couches, yeah. miles. Some friends actually bought plane tickets for us in some cases, you know, some things so like the, that. So the thing I'll speak to is that I think it's really important and what I try to encourage filmmakers is to think about how this film is part of their whole ecosystem and developing an audience and developing a structure for working within your career and how it leads to other things in your career. And that's why, you know, I feel like this kind of split rights direct distribution enables you to do things whereas when you make you know if, if look if an all right sale pays for the film plus gives you extra money that's wonderful right but in lieu of that how do you use whatever release that you have to help make yourself you know lead towards something sustainable developing a relationship with an audience and it's a case-by-case -case individual thing as to whether you know how that works and that's why the importance of building an email list is, is, uh, yeah, that that's true. But the other thing I say is like, I do feel like it's important to plan and budget for distribution and to raise money for distribution while you're, and think of that as an equal component to your production budget. I know it's very difficult being a filmmaker, like it's enough to scrape the money to make the film, much less think about distribution. But I think it's, it's kind of essential these days to, mm -hmm. To, to plan for that. Uh, Ethan. Hi. Uh, so my question is about education. Um, I think the ground has changed a lot since uh, maybe 10 years ago uh, when the advice was to approach maybe individual professors in each department and get the department to buy the film. Now I understand uh, platforms like Canopy and um, I had another one that I had written down, uh, Films Media Group. That what they do is they sell a package of films and you're just one of many, many films. And the amount of money that you're gonna get from that is usually you know, very small off of every screening. Can you talk about that at all? Um, just very briefly, I think um, the direct licenses um, have kind of sprung back. And I think you can still the edu a good educational distributor if you want to DIY this, but you know I it's DIYing educational is tough. But I think that there are departments that are still ordering films. There's still professors that are ordering films. There's libraries that are ordering films, and so I think that's it. Really collapsed during the pandemic for a variety of reasons, but it is a bit on the rebound. Um, in least in my discussions with educational distributors. And then the relationship of Canopy or other kinds of streaming platforms is some educational distributors I work with don't do Canopy or any kind of stream educational streaming. It's all their own. Um, it's all direct sales, pretty much. Um, others work with uh, institutions like Canopy. So there's different approaches. There's no cookie cutter to any of this. And there's not even a cookie cutter within educational distribution anymore. You're talking about DVDs or you're talking about digital? Both. Yeah, a lot of those are being, being sold as digital site licenses and has kind of replaced the DVD. But some places are still ordering DVDs, uh, but it's now turned mostly into digital site licenses. So it's an alternative digital approach to Canopy. All righty. Uh, Heather. Hi. Hi, Lance and John. Thank you for sharing um, this. I'm kind of in the midst of my own self-distribution journey. And um, my question is kind of like, what, where are you seeing the biggest gains um, in distribution um, uh, as far as income? And um, how, what percentage are you to recoupment? It's, I know it's probably not close, but I mean, how, 
where are you on the scale? Um, I would say that, gosh, I don't know the exact numbers in front of me, we're probably somewhere like 10% to recruit, yeah, recruitment. So as a, it, but a oh, I think someone, showing. you all hearing? Yes. Okay. No. Um, I think we're somewhere like 10% to recruitment on the distribution costs. Again, as I mentioned before, we actually raised the money to pay for the film, which also included our our time while we were working on it. So that was what I considered, in a sense, that's what I had thought would be my kind of big responsibility as the producer was to pay for the film, which we figured out a way to do that. I did not assume that the release would cost the amount of time and, and hard costs that it ultimately wound up costing. So we're about 10% in making back what we spent on the um the release i would say that the to me the um the kind of bright spots are i actually feel like tiva is hard but i think you can have much more success on tiva if you are really are aggressive with social particularly paid social um if that's something that you want to um invest in time and, and a little bit of money. Um, and I think educational actually still has a lot of possibility if you position it the right way. And again, as I mentioned in my reflections, I don't think we did. So I would not use our educational strategy with the first step as a good example of how to do it. I would actually start educational much earlier um, and, and try to just maximize those sales. We actually did that with City of Trees. And um, wound up actually making more from educational sales with City of Trees than we did with a Netflix license. So. One of the things I would say about making money, and maybe this doesn't speak directly to Heather, is to like think about underrepresented audiences that maybe have some disposable income. So I know that most doc filmmakers, we deal with a lot of underrepresented audiences, and that's, you know, and that's, you know, what our passion is and, but it's just in terms of if you're strict, if your goal is strictly money is to think about audiences that haven't been, feel that their story has been told before. Um, and those audiences that have disposable income, like Gary Huswitz and a great example and Helvetica, like the design audience had never really been spoken to before and they have disposable income. So he was able to create a very smart strategy around that, um, that, you know, was very profitable. So that's, you know, and I know it's not helpful necessarily for, you know, people who are already in the midst of making a film, but just in the future in terms of sustainability, um, I think that's why that kind of, um, you know, the sex trafficking film that kind of blew up on the right um, was so popular is because there was an audience that hadn't been spoken to before. Um, and there's lots of complications or, you know, that's a very deep dive story, but, um, anyway, that's my tip in terms of, you know, one of my tips in terms of sustainability. Uh, Simon, you need to unmute. Yeah. Uh, John and Lance, yeah, thanks for the, the, the impressions. Very interesting. I'm interested to know, um, have you, with any of your films, had any success getting them broadcast or streamed on non-English language channels? And if you manage to get them shown on an English language channel, such as uh, or streamer, such as Apple or YouTube, does that attract the attention of um, non-English language broadcasters or streamers? Um. Lance, you want to go ahead and talk about the first step? And then I'll talk um, we, about we, just historically with our films, particularly our two features, City of Trees and First Step, we've actually, unfortunately, had really um, poor success outside the U.S. Um, we've never had an international sale or um, uh, broadcast outside of Canada for, for our work. Um, we've actually consistently heard from people in the international sales market that um, our films would not translate to international markets and that they were too US specific. Um, that has not been 
the, the response that we've heard from actual audiences or festivals, but when we've gotten to the sales um, conversation, that's usually what they've um, told us. So we haven't, we haven't, um, I don't have much, unfortunately, have much experience to share. Yeah, um, I can just speak to that. It just, it depends on whether your film is appropriate for, you know, international audiences. And it's much harder because there's so much content now created all around the world. World, There's less of an interest in US-based content. But like we worked with a film called uh, called Nazarin about the Iranian human rights activist Nazarin Sotadeh. And one of the first things we did is brought on a foreign sales outfit and we got it um, telecast into Iran itself, BBC Persia, and like five, six other stations around the world. Um, whether AVA, whether TVOD in the US helps to broadcast, I wouldn't necessarily, that wouldn't be something that I would see necessarily that would help. I would say if you blow up on TVOD, that can really, that can sometimes help second window SVOD sales, um, but not necessarily if that, it depends on, it's very specific on a case by case basis, whether that's going to translate to foreign. Um, Irina, we'll get back to you, um, but you've already asked the question, so I want to get to the others first, and if we have time, we'll get back to you. Uh, Julie, you're up. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Um, I have a question. So I have a documentary that's done, and um, you know I've applied to Sundance. I have a distribution run with um, the Legion of Honors here in San Francisco, but not till 2024. And I definitely would like to do some last fundraising um, before that premiere. What I'm wondering is what platform would you suggest if I was going to, I have about 40,000 followers on Facebook and about 10,000 on Instagram. And um, I'd like to utilize those and do a screening, a private screening for fundraising. What platform would you suggest that I use that's pretty secure when it comes to being able to you know, give a password after someone has paid a certain amount of money um, and do this fundraiser so that it's secure. What platform oh. would you suggest? Well, I was, was going to say for that kind of thing with that many followers, um, um, show and tell is pretty well set up for that, but it's not secure. It uses a Vimeo link. So um, if you want it secure, I would recommend it, recommend Eventive. Um, they have a pretty good, pretty secure platform. A lot of festivals use them because of that, because of their security. And they'll do a single film deal for, I think it's still 300 bucks. You sign up and they'll take on a single film deal. It's a little complicated, but it's, but it's, it's, it's very robust. So, and then I would create a kind of unique way of connecting. You can create your own pathway to doing these kinds of things. And so if you have that for delivery, it's creating how you engage um, with that audience you can do in a variety of what, different ways on your own, so. Thank you, I appreciate that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Jody. Hi there. Uh, question one is kind of prompted by the conversation about the sound of freedom, the feature. Uh, any thoughts on when you have a doc that sort of been out there is no longer it's out of distribution i did one on any traffic and i'd love to see is there a way to get it back in rotation sort of piggyback off something that's in the conversation in the zeitgeist um and get it back in there second quick one is any thoughts or experience on kind of grabbing a film back from a massive distributor um i know taylor swift can do it but you've got somebody and they've got it and it's just sitting there after a while is there any way of getting it back when there's all these other new ways to kind of self-distribute after it's had a run and it's still, well i would ever, we're talking about yeah. evergreen films yeah yeah i would look at your agreement and see what out clauses you have and see you know i don't know what year you are in the agreement i don't know the distributor you could just ask you know sometimes you can ask hey i want to pursue a different path how can we discuss blah 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 um, if they're in breach which there are some distributors who are in breach these days like if they I would look at Yes. Uh, yeah. Well, other like Passion River went into huge breach. There's another one that I've heard about recently, which is having trouble. Um, 
So if they're in breach, then you can just say you're in breach and you were pulling the film. So it just depends on, um, I would look at what clauses, like what the accounting, uh, the first thing I'd look at the accounting clauses and if they violated those, then they're in breach and then you can pull. But some, it depends on the distributor. Some will say, hey, we're not really doing anything with it. If you want to take it, here it is. You know, you can have it back. Depends on how, you know, good those distributors are. And it's, again, case by case. Um, and then uh, getting on the, on the sec, you know, uh, I don't know if you want to really on the tailwind of Sound of Freedom, as people have mentioned already that, you know, it's already kind of like the, the sex trafficking world is pretty against that film and all the people that are around that film. But um, you could probably target, I would probably your easiest way is Facebook ad targeting through Facebook Business Manager. Um, you could even probably, Sound of Freedom is probably a targetable audience these days. Uh, but then you get into weird stuff is like, okay, are you going to target QAnon as an audience? Because they certainly, and I, you get into territory that you don't even want to deal with. But there are ways to target people through Facebook visits, you know, better audiences through Facebook Business Manager. And unfortunately, I do recommend this. I mean, Facebook is a troubling institution, but they do have, um, provide tools which, you know, are still pretty decent. Some people would argue with how well those tools work, but, you know, at least they're accessible and rel still let relatively low cost. Okay. Um, we have time for David, then Irina, and then I will wrap it up with, I have two final questions. Uh, David. Am, you know, sorry, my camera's not it. working for some reason today. Uh, I've got a meeting with a, uh, I would call it a, in impact producing company uh -huh. uh tuesday and and it, were there any kind of questions i should be really focused on thinking about with them when i talk to them and also or john are, are, is that what you would consider yourself as an in impact producer um i consider myself more of a producer of marketing and distribution <laughs> Um, and even though I don't normally take that credit, I sometimes ask for that credit, depending on how involved I get. Um, I usually bring on an impact producer. I've worked as an impact producer before, but generally, um, I usually bring on an impact producer in terms of what questions you should ask. Um, also let Lance, I would just, A, what their passion for the film is, what their interest, what their ideas for reaching out to organizations, who they think the audiences are who they think the strong players within those audiences are, um, you know, how they, you know, you know, they might be coy about saying what their plan is, you know, until you hire them, but, you know, as much as you can kind of think about like what, you know, what, how they feel, you know, you should um, proceed, then you, you should come prepared with knowing what your, what your theory of change is. You know, what are you, what is your thoughts in terms of what kind of change within changing the world, what kind of change and talk to them and see if they feel like that's realistic and ask them what they feel is realistic. Those would be some of the questions I would, I would ask. Lance, what would you ask? You have pretty intense involvement in this. I would, I mean, I think you, you, you covered it. I think hearing how they talk about the film to me is really critical because without just kind of uh, regurgitating in a sense, whatever you may have told them, but I would want to hear in their own words how they describe the film and what it meant to them, because in a sense, they're going to be an ambassador of you as the filmmaker and others who are part of the film. And I would just want to feel that they've internalized the film in a way that feels right to you. Um, and I would also just want to make sure that their goals are aligned with yours. I think, you know, it's going back to some principles that we talked about earlier. Um, a number of people asked about the slides and how to get it. Um, I, I first want to say, uh, John's put his email address in the chat and maybe you could do it again, John, but um, he'll be happy to send you a link to the slides if you email him. Uh, we will yeah. also- I'll put probably put you on my email list if you do that. Yes, it comes at a cost. Um, and in we'll fact, give me a little time because what we'll do is we'll make it an autoresponder for give us a day and we'll make it the autoresponder if you signed up for our email list. Okay. So that that's yeah. 
And then we will also put it up on the D word and uh, that's once John has the link, we'll put it up in our um, probably on our face to face topic, which is where we put notes about our face to faces. Uh, okay, Irina, you're the last uh, guest to ask okay. a question. Thank you so much. Really appreciate the second opportunity. So going back to something that you mentioned before, uh, you were talking about screeners, uh, the actual screenings, and saying that you definitely pass around at least three clipboards. I wanted to bring you back for that momentarily and ask that plus possibly best practices for a screening? Like what's the ultimate thing that I want to get out of the audience and the panel discussion? Um, well, e for distribute like email addresses, but then I would also see if you can get someone in who to have at least an iPhone and to be talk asking people's reactions to the film as they exit the theater. So that then you can cut that into like a 30 second clip. Um, and you can also, if extract the text of that and put that on your website and just get their names, you know, ask their permission and just get a quote. And that's, I think, very helpful. Um, and, um, and then also try to have a, if you can have a slide on after the presentation, you create a slide, give it to the theater in advance that has your website on there, how they can sign up for the email list. You can do the QR code thing there as well for those people that will do that and just has some, so that people all during the Q and A can see information about the basic information about the film and how to how to get engaged. So those would be the key things. Because yeah. Um, okay. So my final questions to you guys. Uh, this is more for John. I think um, if you were approached by a filmmaker who's not making a change the world documentary, maybe not even making a make money documentary, but is motivate you know is doing a very personal. Uh, character driven story that is mm -hmm. not about social issues so they may not have this kind of these like kind of many of the films that you make Doug perhaps or <laughs> many in the group here yeah, um, I'm kidding you uh well you know it, 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 it's that's true but um yes. you know who may not have which are some of my favorite films to be honest I think those yes, are some I'm... of the most beautiful wonderful films or those yes, films mine too but they may not have come with this package of impact partners um, may not even have you know a, a, a niche audience other than it relates to everyone who has uh, two eyeballs and you know a, a heart um, what kind of help you know can you give them when you don't have that um, and also let's just say they're on a limited budget as well and they're halfway through what's kind of the best advice you can give? for filmmakers in that uh, boat. It's hard to like say something in five minutes or even one minute here. I mean, the, well, what I would say, six, uh, I would say is like, you know, bring me on to help you consult. And that's what I would, that's the, cause it takes a, a while. Like it, like I have to look at the film. We have to talk about it. We, we would generally, and just, we would look at like everything in the slide deck, kind of like the basic principles and kind of like how it relates to you and especially like who your audience is and kind of, because I think there are specific audiences for every film. But I mean, and if it's truly just an audience that likes, you know, those kind of personal documentaries, you can probably divine that in some sense. But I do feel that there's a way to, you know, to develop your audiences and to figure out a path for your film. But it's just, it's a, that's why I said at the very beginning, every film is different. And even within those personal docs that, you know, you limit it down to like, no, you can probably find audiences within there. Um, and, and then it's just a matter of like, you know, going back to what you want to try to accomplish with the film, you know, so. Lance, you have your hand up. You have a question? No, it was, a, I just wanted to weigh in. I know it's mostly a John thing, but I was going to say that even in our case, you know, you're seeing at the end of the process like all those impact pack partners we didn't start with them mm -hmm. um so i you know it's easy to maybe like look back and go wow all these groups but actually at the beginning of this process that list was not that and the, for us and i think that this may also apply to at least some personal docs um 
that even don't have these kinds of dynamics. I, I'm always a huge believer in regional film festivals um, and just film festivals more broadly because for us, um, a lot of what we've learned over the years with this film and our other film about who those audiences are came through just having those experiences, sharing the film in festivals and just feeling out who the film resonated with and then building some strategy, a strategy around that. So, and I would even say, even before that, you can even do you'll learn and works a lot in progress about, screenings. Yes, too. we've done just, a lot yes. of. Yeah, I go back to also to your, you know, a, a key point that you made earlier, which was like one of the best decisions you made was to, you know, not do an academy campaign. As as a member of the academy, I've got to tell you, you you know, it's heartbreaking to see the number of very, you know, low budget docs that are trying to compete with you know documentaries backed by netflix hbo and the like apple who are pouring money into these things and having you know celebrity driven screenings and um uh and deal you know and influencer screenings and it's just you know it's much money much better used for what you were you were doing last question before we go um what would be your best advice to a lot of filmmakers are in the boat of they're you know strapped for funding they're taking on way too many roles themselves they're probably producing you know because they can't get a producing part can't afford a producer um and they don't have they they just haven't even begun the work of outreach and marketing um so they're sort of in this midway point, you know, uh, they can't afford John to bring you on even, you know, at this point, what can they be doing themselves? What's sort of the best first steps they can take towards building up, you know, is it, is it trying to find partner organizations? Is it building up a social media presence? What, what, what do you think are the best first steps? Well, I'll just jump in. So this aspect of my book from 2010 is still relevant. Audience building, like the TVOD stuff that's, you know, there's a fair amount of chapters that kind of like fell out of, and that's why I haven't reissued the book, but the book's still available as an ebook. And all this audience building stuff in the book is still pretty relevant. They, obviously the social, chin, even some of the social tips are still relevant. Think but, outside the box office, by the way. Think outside the box office. So. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, if you really have no money, that's kind of what the book was written for. Like when I, when I first wrote those articles for Filmmaker, people would come up to me and say, oh, can you consult? And, you know, okay. And I, at that point I was like, okay, 75 bucks. Oh, how about 25 bucks? And I literally wrote the book for that guy who had 25 bucks and I sold it for 19 bucks. So, or 1995 at the time. So that's, I would say that's a first start, plus there's plenty of information around, but, you know, I would just look at different avenues of audience development and go after each one at this point. Um, while Lance is giving that uh, same advice, can you put a link to the, where the book can be gotten, John? In the, oh, in God the forbid, I'm going to have to put the Amazon link in, so. <laughs> um, Whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I would just say from um, from my end, um, I think that just talking with people, I mean, it sounds really basic, so apologies for giving such basic feedback, but... It's basic um, question. Talking to friends and people you trust and sharing whatever you've got at that point and not being too precious about what you have or haven't done, but just sharing, you know, if it's a demo, if it's rough scenes, if it's a treatment, a deck, a proposal, whatever it is, just being able, be, feeling comfortable sharing and then feeling comfortable talking about it with people and then getting feedback and being in some sort of dialogue with people who you trust and trying to just expand that over time. I think that um, you start to learn more about why you're actually doing whatever it is that you're doing if you weren't already clear about it in the first place, which for me is often the case. Um, and then over time, I think you can start to get clear, clearer about what's important to you to do. And also more importantly, what's not important to do. And I think once you can also actually start to 
clear the brush of all the things, you know, we mentioned awards, but there's plenty of others. Maybe film festivals aren't important, you know, whatever it might be, you can start to actually clear the brush of things that could be distractions and then just really zero in on what's most important to you. And you get to define that as a filmmaker that's not for anyone else to define. So I feel like you learn a lot of that through those conversations. Uh, John, just put in the link to it, but, but um, Joseph made a great uh, point of uh, trying to get the John's book through the greatest bookstore in the universe, uh, Powell's Bookstore in Portland. Oh. Um, so highly recommend that link. Oh, good. Uh, Great. And highly, yeah. highly, highly recommend the book. I um, just realized it's not, the ebook is not on Amazon anymore. I have to talk to my distributor about that. It's <laughs> like, maybe I've been ragging on Amazon too much lately and they're starting to drop me from there. You know, <laughs> that's like, that was actually surprising. Um, I used to sell it from my website and maybe I'll start selling it from my website again. Um, another book I would read about, like, so my other high uh, choke point capitalism will give you a very good understanding of why we got to where we are and also with some solutions. I'm recommending it to everyone. It's not a ton about film. It's mostly music and, and books. There is some, but that's about monopolization and the no notion that we're actually under a monopsony, which is where the buyers of content, which are like streamers in this case, have a monopoly. So we're creators suffering under a monopsony who have a monopoly. So, and there's, I would recommend following what's going on with the FTC and the, some of the best things Biden has done lately is he appointed very, very activist people in the FTC and the head of the antitrust division. And they actually have suits now against Amazon and Google respectively. So, and those are being written up about, I would follow if you're interested in this, Matt Stoller has a Substack that is open and i've uh, in my emails i've um, um and i'd be talking about i would sign up for my email list i'd recommend you know but i'm you know kind of talking about this whenever i get a chance but i would follow Ma matt stoller he actually has someone in the google trial um writing about it every day and it's really fascinating if you want to really dive into or not even dive that deeply but really get a s understanding of like why we're so fucked right now but the great thing about the choke point capitalism is he has lots of, you know, a number of different solutions in there um, as to how we can get out of this, which is very inspiring, I found. We had we had Brian Newman as a guest a couple of months ago. Yeah. I highly, highly recommend his. Oh, yeah. Sign up to Brian's newsletter. Um, you know, I would even sign up, you know, Ted Hope is very inspiring. So. But I would do if you're yeah, Matt Stoller is great. And he also, you know, he anyway. I don't have to. Um, thank you guys both so much. Any final words you want to, you um, might want to say on your on your way out? <laughs> I guess the final word I'll have is plugging my this uh, the distribution intensive that I'm doing, um, and it's priced I think pretty well. I mean I'm charging for it. I wish I was funded by a nonprofit and I could do it for free, but um, I am charging for it. But it's a pretty good price point. And I'm pretty excited about it. And if, you know, it's, um, so anyway, that's. Thanks, John. Uh, Lance, any any final word? Um, yeah, first of all, just thank you, Doug and Erica and everyone at The Word. Really, really appreciate you having us. Thanks to everyone who's stuck on this call. Also really? for a like hundred people for uh, all this time. So thank you for your generous participation and all the questions. And, you know, I've tried to, answer things in the chat. If there was anything that um, wasn't covered, I put my email address in the chat. Please feel free to email me. Um, happy to, to share. The only thing I would just add as a final thought is like um, just the extent to which you can, um, people can help each other na just navigate all these things. I love what John is doing with this cohort in the distribution intensive. It, hope people can sign up for it and even beyond that just more transparent sharing amongst filmmakers and between filmmakers and the distributors or industry people who will share is excellent just any type of transparency and sharing um, is is only for the better in my opinion so when you feel faced with an opportunity to be transparent or push someone for transparency please um, try to step into that space because i think it helps us all yeah and we thank you uh lance and particular for sharing you know some of the financial 
um, matters involved in your film. Very, it's very rare for filmmakers to do that um, in, a, <clears throat> in such a public way. So um, appreciate your article you wrote for documentary magazine and, and for you know, your own transparency here today. And thank you, John, as always. Um, and um, yeah, I hope you'll get a flock of people coming to your course and reading your book and Lance seeing the first step in your and all your work. Thank you.